So hi, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank uh, the organisers for, for inviting me to talk here today. Um, I'm a new PI working in the Walton Card, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you about uh, breathing after spinal cord injury. Oh, no, that's not me. There we go. No, still not me. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to do this without slides. Okay. Yeah. So, four million people in the UK um, suffer from spinal cord injury, or the effects from spinal cord injury. Respiratory motor dysfunction is the major cause of morbidity and mortality following spinal cord injury. Well, it's, this is why it's really important for us to recover this function. Now, the major reason why respiratory motor function is such a big deficit following spinal cord injury is because the pathways which control uh, respiratory muscles are innervated in this, mostly through the cervical spinal cord, that's in the neck. And this is where the majority of spinal cord injuries occur. Anything below the spinal cord injury tends to be paralysed. So we get paralysis of our major mus respiratory muscles, and that includes your diaphragm. So that's the major muscle you use to breathe in and slightly to breathe out. Now, one of the big dogmas in spinal cord injury research is that, it's, that the, the longer uh, you leave an injury um, after the trauma to treat it, the harder it is to get functional repair. And that's because there's a buildup of, of uh, spinal, uh, scar tissue, of inflammatory, inflammatory factors, and also because of cell death. Now, unfortunately, m the millions of people which suffer from the effects of spinal cord injury are, of course, at these chronic stages, at stages a long time after the trauma. So our treatment strategies try and look at trying to repair respiratory motor function at these long, critical time points after spinal cord injury. Now, I don't focus on trying to repair the injury itself. We actually try and focus on looking at the areas of the spinal cord where respiratory motor neurons are innervated, and that's actually normally below the level of injury. How do we do that? Well, we mostly <laughs> use uh, treatments that induce plasticity. Plasticity encourages growth and also to form new functional connections within the spinal cord. So the way that I do that is by using an enzyme which removes the matrix surrounding respiratory motor neurons. Um, that matrix normally um, stabilizes the cell, but in this case we remove it so we can get new growth and new connections being formed. And that's an enzyme called chondroitinase ABC. The second thing we do is we direct that new growth into um, kind of the areas that we want it to go by respiratory rehabilitation. And that basically means we put our animals into lower oxygen conditions for a very short period of time just to make them breathe a little bit faster and a little bit stronger. Now, I remember, so we talked about the fact that we're looking at injuries a long time after the trauma. Now, I don't do this in humans, I have to say. This is in a rat model. Um, what we do is we injure our rats and le left them for a year and a half. Now, I want to point out the respiratory motor system kind of really luckily can work in two halves. So I can injure half the cord and cause paralysis of one half of your diaphragm, but the other half is still functioning normally. So my nice little rats are still running around their cages, eating and drinking, <coughs> and I'm quite happy. So don't worry, I'm not really cruel. And there's something on a ventilator for a year and a half. Um, but basically what we can see, if I could show you my traces, was that half the diaphragm is working beautifully. You get these lovely big bursts of inspiratory activity. And the other half for a year and a half has been completely paralyzed. But I said, give this treatment strategy. This animal's been paralyzed for a year and a half. Just within seven days, we start seeing activity in that ipsilateral hemidiaphragm. And in fact, with four weeks of treatment, we see these beautiful, huge bursts of activity within that ipsilateral hemidiaphragm. That's in 100% of animals. Uh, and in fact, that activity is indistinguishable from normal activity within the diaphragm. So essentially, we've taken an animal, we've injured it when it's an adult, and we've repaired that dysfunction when it's um, an oxygenarian. And that uh, repair lasts for over six months. So essentially, it's profound recovery that is almost permanent. Now, interestingly, if, if we take an animal and actually apply that treatment strategy at the acute stages of injury, we don't see that recovery, which indicates to us that we have this ongoing plasticity following trauma 
which we could harness in our uh, patient cohort to actually um, bring about uh, sort of normal functioning respiratory motor activity. We've identified the mechanism of this um, uh, recovery, which is through serotonergic mechanisms. And so we're now developing new uh, techniques to try and apply this to the clinic uh, and develop forward, for me personally, an animal model, but develop forward uh, better and optimized treatment strategies um, that we can apply, hopefully, to patients in the future. So essentially, what I've been talking about is the fact that we've now shown that we can um, apply plasticity to recover normal functional um, activity in the respiratory motor system at long, <coughs> chronic time points after spinal cord injury, which is really needed um, in the clinical population. So thank you.